Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. This is our last message on, on this series. And I want to talk today about uh, living spirit-filled and spirit-led. Living spirit-filled and spirit-led. And just to, to segue from and to connect to last week's message, you know that the way to discover your spiritual gifts is to be in community with other believers so God can use your gifts. And so we discover our spiritual gifts by being in the fellowship, in the body of Christ, because the gifts are for two reasons. God has given the gifts to edify or build up the church. And also, secondly, to glorify God in and outside the church, outside these walls. That's the two reasons for the gifts. But here's the thing. You can't operate in the gifts unless you have the believers around you to actually operate in them or other people that are not believers. So it implies that we must be in fellowship, biblical fellowship, and be in our community so God will use our gifts. Now, that's not a, a huge... Uh, you know, um, amazing point. But to me, I feel like it's critical because unless we're in fellowship and in connection with other people, we're not going to operate in our gifts. We're definitely not going to discover them and we're definitely not going to grow in them. So I want to encourage you to make sure that you are living in community with other believers, whether it's getting coffee, whether it's having a Bible study, whether it's here on Sunday morning uh, in, a, in a small group throughout the week, let God use you, and you'll begin to notice you're operating in your gifts. Amen? So let's talk about that. Spirit-filled, spirit-led, even using our gifts throughout the week. I've heard people say that why, isn't, why aren't the gifts operating more today like they were in the New Testament? Why is the Holy Spirit not working so much on Sunday mornings and such. And I think it's actually a really good question. I've heard it my entire uh, life as a pastor. I've heard it in other churches. I've heard other pastors talking about it. Where is the works of the Holy Spirit? Where are the gifts? Where's the move of God? Well, let me just go ahead and make sure we all understand something. It's not just on Sundays that the Holy Spirit wants to work. If you want to see the Spirit of God move, you need to move with God. Did you hear what I said? God is moving. The question is, are we going to get in the flow with God and his Spirit and what he's up to? And you're going to see it. You're going to see the works of God, the powerful move of the person and the, and the presence of the Holy Spirit working in your life. I'm just saying some of my points right now. I'm not even waiting to the end. We don't, we don't need, I always use this illustration. We don't need the Holy Spirit to watch Netflix. I mean, maybe we do. Right? Maybe we need the Holy Spirit to work in us, to convict us, and to turn it off, right? Amen. So the Holy Spirit's going to work. But be careful that we're not denying the Holy Spirit so much that we don't recognize him working in us anymore. When you start doing the will of God to reach a loss, you're going to need the Holy Spirit. When you're in fellowship with the body of Christ and someone's struggling and hurting and they need an encouraging word, whoever has that gift of encouragement, boom, just bless that entire group or that community of people. So look, if you want to see the Holy Spirit work, we got to do some things. We got to start following God. We got to start obeying. We got to start by faith living and filled with the Holy Spirit and be spirit led. So I'm not just saying that though. Let's go to Acts and we're going to open up into Acts 3 and 4. And there's so much scripture. I didn't dare do this to the tech guys. So we'll have a few verses here and there. But tech, um, thank you so much for your hard work and ladies. Sorry, and ladies, but I'm talking about my leadership team. Uh, we're going to be reading through X, uh, Acts 3 and Acts 4, and I want to give you the first part of how the Holy Spirit works in ministry of miracles, the ministry of miracles. And right away, you're like, not me. Don't count yourself out. You've heard me say this. 
Six weeks before this happens, Peter was denying Christ. Hiding. Next thing you know, he's being used to do a miracle. Let's read it. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. Ooh, that's cool. Prayer service at 3 o'clock. There was lots of prayer services back then. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, as he did, see, by faith, as he stood up, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up and stood on his feet and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. Ooh, that's beautiful. It's a beautiful gate, but that's a beautiful miracle. You know why? He spent his life outside those gates, outside that temple, and now he was changed by Jesus, and he's worshiping with them in the temple. Hello? Wake up. I want Delaware to be changed out there and then want to join us in here for praise and worship. And because we don't have enough room in this building and I don't have enough energy to do 10 services, we need every church to have this kind of move because it's not about just one church. How beautiful would it be to be praying and reaching and loving a neighbor and then in a couple weeks they're sitting next to you in church and you can look over and go, oh my goodness, they're sitting right next to me. The thing is, is this didn't happen inside the church, this happened outside the church. This happened outside the temple. The Spirit of God is moving here and out there. And he was moving through a man named Peter. And another one named John. And the church, men and women. He's moving. He's working. When you're spirit-filled and, and spirit-led, you'll have supernatural solutions for people's needs. Think about that for a second. Supernatural Solutions, miracles instead of band-aids. Miracles. Not me, not me, Ryan. I, I, can't, I can't do a miracle. God wants to do a miracle through your prayers. And God can. Don't say God can't do something. God can do whatever he wants. If we're yielded to the Spirit and we're led by the Spirit, your little tiny, feeble prayer could turn into a miracle, a simple prayer. Now, he spoke with authority here, but God will use it. Well, we're not done. Let's go to the next portion of Scripture. Oh, let me finish this off, actually. I'm getting ahead of myself. Verse 9, all the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. And then this is what happens next, verse 12. Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd. Ooh, I love that. When you're spirit-filled and spirit-led, you get spiritual vision to see and seize opportunities. Come on now, think about this. Sometimes when you're not moving with the Spirit, you just don't see things, but they're in front of us all the time. Opportunities are always being handed to us on a silver platter, but we need to have spiritual vision. And when we're Spirit-filled, we've been hanging out with God all week, and we've been praying, and we've been worshiping, we've been studying the Word, and we've been obedient to be used by the Spirit. We're going to go out into our workplaces, out into this community, out to grocery stores and coffee shops, and you're going to see someone in need, and you're going to respond because you have spiritual vision. That's what it means to be spirit-filled and spirit-led. Praise the Lord. What does he say? Well, Peter responds and addresses the crowd that are astounded. He says, people of Israel, what is so surprising about this? And why stare at us as though we had made this man walk by our own power or godliness? 
For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all ancestors, who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected before Pilate, despite Pilate's decision to release him. You rejected this holy, righteous one, he's talking about Jesus, instead, instead demanded the release of a murderer, he's talking about Barabbas. You killed the author of life. He's getting bold, isn't he? But God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this fact. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed, and you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Don't go out in the power of your name because there is no power in it. When you pray in Jesus' name, be healed. It's his name, not your name. Pressure off. Thank the Lord. Because you don't want people following you. You want people following Jesus. Friends. Now let me make sure I correct, correct a little something. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. We do need to be examples for people. Some people need to follow our example so they can see Christ. So I'm going to clarify that. Verse 17, friends, I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance. Now he's showing, he hit them hard and now he's showing some, some compassion and empathy. He's being gentle now. He says, I, you did it in ignorance. See, people don't realize that they're living in, in sin. They're, they're lost. They don't know what Christ has come to do. Thank God for Christmas time so we can celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ and why he came. And this is what he goes on to say. But God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. And then he says this. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. And he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. He's talking about the second coming there. Repentance is not a bad word. It means to turn away from death. I thank God that someone told me to repent. I thank God that someone told me to confess my sins and to believe in Jesus Christ and to turn to God because I found salvation. There is nothing wrong with telling people to turn away from their life if they don't have Christ and to turn to Jesus. There is nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with it. And let the Spirit lead you on how to say it and when to do it. Verse 21 says, for he must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for for you a prophet like me from among your own people. Listen carefully to everything he tells you. He's talking about Jesus. Then Moses said, anyone who would not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from God's people. We want people to hear Jesus. Now let's go down to to chapter 4. Chapter 4, but before we do that, when we have the Spirit working in us, when we're in tune and filled with the Holy Spirit, when we're out there in our world living life, whether it's prompted by a miracle or prompted by your behavior, your joy, your encouragement, whatever God does through your life, the light of Jesus that shines through you, People are going to wonder, and they're going to ask questions. This crowd was amazed and astounded. And right away, the Holy Spirit on Wednesday brought this verse to me, 1 Peter 3, 14 through 16, and it's applicable to the next portion of Scripture too. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. This is on the screen for you too, as well. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. I love that part. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. You know, Peter... He wasn't the most experienced 
apostle or he didn't even have a time to prepare a sermon. When this miracle took place and everyone was astounded, they're asking questions and he was ready to give an answer right back at them. Are we ready to give an answer as the Lord uses us in powerful ways? One of the things that Peter did know is he did know Jesus. Peter knew the word, and he knew the life of Christ. He knew the message, and so he began to answer their questions. We should not overlook the power of knowing the word of God in our lives and knowing Jesus and sharing what we know about him. Amen? And what has he done in your life? Now, chapter 4, things start turning in a different direction. And we all know that uh, when momentum gets going and things are looking up and things are going well, you're going to face opposition. Well, the Holy Spirit is there to help us do ministry of miracles, proclaiming the good news, and the Holy Spirit is in your life to give you courage to face opposition. Courage. Chapter 4, verse 1. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain, the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people. You ready for this? They're disturbed. The pe- <laughs> this always shocks me. Because today, this, this, this wouldn't be a reason to get arrested. But maybe it's coming. Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus, there is a resurrection of the dead. So they're in trouble for teaching doctrine, for teaching the truth, for teaching that Jesus rose from the dead. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, put them in jail until the morning. But you can't stop God. Verse 4, but many of the people who heard their message believed it. Thank God that Peter just spoke up and explained what was happening. The number of believers now totaled about 5,000 men, not counting women and children. It was time to meet the council the next day. So verse 5, the next day, the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. They brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? Now, just so you know, if you're newer to the church and newer to Scripture, this is religious People who believed in God but not in Christ now fighting with Jesus and his followers. Okay? Persecuting Christians. They're in trouble for being out in the public preaching about Jesus. That's interesting to me. Think about that. Then Peter... Filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he says these powerful words. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Praise the Lord. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. When you're spirit-filled and spirit-led, you will have the courage to testify about Jesus Christ, even in the face of opposition. And you know what happens here? Jesus' promise in Luke 11, or Luke 12, we have this on the screen for you. Luke 12, 11 through 12, it says, And when you are brought to trial in the synagogues and before rulers and authorities, don't worry about how to defend yourself or what to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at the time when what needs to be said. The Holy Spirit's going to do that for you too. He's going to give you the words to say when you need it. It may not be as drastic as this situation. It may be you're having a cup of coffee with someone, and the Holy Spirit gives you the words to say. Now just remember, though, 
that they knew the scriptures too. They weren't perfect at it. They, they're human. They knew the message of Christ. They were eyewitnesses of Jesus. Their lives have been changed, okay? So there is importance of study and, and re, uh, reflecting on your own story, reflecting on what you know about Christ. But the Spirit can also fill in the gaps and give you what to say. Of course, we have to be willing to speak up, right? So let's keep reading. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. When your spirit filled and when your spirit led, you will glorify God and you will resemble Christ. People will be like, man, they look like some. See, see now we're in a world, a post Christian, post church world. People don't even know who Jesus is. I've talked to people in our lobby that don't know what we're doing when we come here on Sunday. They don't get it. We have pastors. I'm in a, I'm in a pastor's thread, and we are finding uh, one of the pastors just recently posted that I literally talked to a person who didn't know. Who, the name, who Jesus was or his name. Of course, you know, is there movies and stuff like that? Yeah, and things like that. But they didn't know who Jesus was, and they live in America. So some people aren't going to recognize that you've been with Jesus, but these people recognize because Jesus lived at that time. And so these leaders saw them and said, whoa, you, you look like Jesus. You're Christ-like. That's where the word Christian comes from, to be Christ-like. At this point, they're amazed at these Ordinary men with no special training. Thank God for that. That means God can use us too, right? Verse 14 says, but since then they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them. There was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred among themselves. What should we do with these men? They asked each other. We can't deny that they have performed a miraculous sign and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak any, to anyone in Jesus' name again. So they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. Amen. The council then threatened them further, but they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign, the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. Who is to say that today you, don't, you leave church and you pray for someone and they're, and they're healed and it changes whoever's watching and all those that that person goes home to? Who's to say? And by the way, at this point, the miracle is preaching itself, isn't it? They can't argue with this miracle. Come on now. This world is going to come against us as Christians more and more in the end times. But how are you going to argue with a miracle? And I mean a genuine miracle. None of this fake stuff you see sometimes. I mean an authentic miracle. And the funny thing is, it's going to be by someone you would never expect too. It's not going to always be by the shiny pastor on stage. It's going to be by someone like you living in Magnolia, Delaware, who decides to pray for somebody. And you know what's going to happen? Is people are going to go, whoa, what is going on? It's Jesus working. It's the Holy Spirit working. And you can't argue with that. They released them. They let them go. They were free. Now, look, I'm not saying go into your workplace, stand on your desk, and start yelling about, you know, the name of Jesus, which, you know, Jesus is awesome, but he wants you to respect the authority too, right? But look, you got a lunch break. Come on. If someone is across your table or wants to go out to lunch with you and they need some prayer or they need some encouragement, use the gift of the Holy Spirit. Use, just follow the lead in the Holy Spirit and find out what gift he wants to use for you that day. So, you know, be careful, all right? You know, the scriptures say, be wise as serpents, but gentle as doves, okay? There's times for certain things and times not to do certain things, all right? 
And I want you to stay in your workplace to be a light, not necessarily get fired and then quote this scripture. <laughs> you can't stop. You, I, I can talk about. No, there's a time and place for everything. Again, the context is they're out in the community. They're out in the public square and they're getting arrested for this. Imagine you're at Target and you get arrested for talking about Jesus outside of Target. It's the same thing. Okay. They try to silence the apostles, and when I was praying, God gave me a little something to say today, and I'm going to say it. Because the world is trying to silence us as Christians. And they're working hard to discourage you, to threaten you, to make sure you don't talk about your faith. But I got to say, while that concerns me, I'm more concerned that we as believers have silenced ourselves. What do I mean by that? That we just simply don't talk about Jesus as much as we should. You know what the devil's going to do? If he can keep you distant from God in your personal walk with him, like no one's watching, if he can keep you from slowing down long enough to read the Bible and pray, if he can make you wake up with fear and anxiety, he can make you wake up with the to-do list you would tackle, if he can get you distracted from hanging out with God, he's going to keep you. He's going to keep you from knowing the heart of God and living the heart of God out. The devil is slick like that. And in our flesh doesn't help either. When you're tired, do you want to labor in prayer for an hour and read the word? Probably not. But that's when we deny the flesh and start living by the spirit and start interceding for our world that is going to hell in a handbasket right now. That's why we do it. That's why when I don't feel good or I'm tired or I had a rough day, I still need to be spending time with God. Before work, before the day, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. The point is I need to be with him because the devil is trying to keep me from the heart of God. Do not let yourself or the devil silence you. And let me say something else too. No, politics or opinion is going to save somebody. They were lifting up the name of Jesus, not politics, not opinions, not personal views of things. We glorify the name of Jesus and he breaks down strongholds and saves people who have different views than us, different positions than us in this world, and he starts saving lives. All right, I'll try. What I'm saying is keep Jesus first. Proclaim his name. Show Jesus to the world. That's what we're about here at church, at Calvary. That's what God's about. It's what Jesus wants us to do. Let's make sure we're getting caught talking about Jesus more than anything else. Because in the end, no, none of my political views and none of my personal opinions of all that's going on is going to save somebody. And, and if I leave the earth right about my views and they leave the earth wrong about their views, because, you know, we're always right. And then they go to hell and I go to heaven. I'm going to have to pay for that. I'm going to have to live with that. Or I'm, God's going to be like, this is what you did with your time. I don't want to be like that. I want to say that I talked about Jesus more than anyone else. And I definitely wasn't gossiping. Mm -hmm. This all happened. And it's like, okay, it's been a long day. It's time to go home and take a nap. Peter and John. Nope. Let's go to the next verse in verse 23. Did you guys like that? Nope. I'm a little excited about the word of God. Verse 23 says, as soon as they were freed, they went and got a Starbucks. No. <laughs> Peter and John returned to the other believers. Oh, okay. Okay, so like today, you know, we got church, and then tonight we get together again for prayer, right? All right, or maybe you're at work and, and there's a prayer meeting or there's something going on that night and so you come out. 
Okay, as soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago about the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. Hey, spiritual warfare against Jesus coming into the earth. Don't forget, they tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby. Spiritual warfare from the Old Testament moving in. And now today, in this story and in our lives, there's going to be warfare against anyone who follows Jesus and especially against Jesus. Now, verse 29 says something really powerful. I don't need to get to because of time. And now, this is their response to being in prison, to being in prison for a night. This is their response to the threats. And now, O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great bonus in preaching your word. Well, they're definitely not going to be silent. Stretch out your hand with healing power. Who do you think is going to be the hands and feet of that healing power? Us, the church. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after this prayer, the meeting place shook. This room would shake. And, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, kind of like Acts 2, when they were baptized in, in Pentecost. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Do you want to see a move of the Holy Spirit? Do you want to see the Holy Spirit work through you? Do you want to see the gifts of the Spirit in action? Then we got to follow Jesus. It was, they were living for God. They were living for God. They were heading to a prayer meeting at the temple. And instead, they decided to heal someone. I don't know if they prayed afterward. Oh, yeah, they did. They entered the temple with the man, had a great day. Wow, how cool was that? That was a different prayer meeting. And then he preaches to the crowd. who's was like, who is this guy? How did he get healed? What happened? They were living for God, filled by the Spirit, led by the Spirit. They were ready. And when they ran into someone, who needed help, they prayed. They had spiritual vision to see it. They had spiritual vision to see and seize opportunities. They had courage to face opposition. And then they had the body of Christ to come together and pray together. That's why we do prayer meetings. That's why we meet together for church. That's why we have small groups. That's why we have little Bible studies and, and coffee meetups with people or in our home. We open up our home. That's why we get down to business and start praying and reading the word and helping each other and encouraging one another so that the gifts of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit will work through his church. That's why. What I love about this prayer is it wasn't just for them. It was really for the mission their prayer was outward. They wanted to be used by God. That's how you're going to see the works of the Spirit. That's how you're going to, it's not even about seeing the work of the Spirit. It's about seeing souls saved. Amen? That's the real reason. If we're, if we're focusing on just looking for the works of the Spirit, you've missed the point. The Spirit is moving to reach the, the souls of Delaware and beyond. That's why the Spirit wants to use you. God wants to use you. And I'm so sick of the devil saying you can't be used. I'm so tired of us not being in the flow of the Holy Spirit, getting into the current of the Holy Spirit and letting him use us. Man, we have seen nothing yet. Once we start following Jesus into the mission field, I'm telling you, Christianity, it gets real exciting when we do this. It gets real exciting. If you think church is great on Sunday morning, wait till you start following the Holy Spirit's lead throughout the week. Ooh, you're going to come in excited. You're going to be praising God. You're going to be dancing. Not that you already aren't. Can we pray this, though? Can we pray this prayer together? In unity and agreement, can we pray for this same thing? 
Let me stand together. This is it. We're closing. Oh, man, I left some good notes out. We'll experience the presence and power of the Holy Spirit when we obey God and go into situations where he is needed. What good is it to have brand new tools that just stay in the shed? You've been made new in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2.10 says that he has ordained and planned for good works for you to do long before. You are equipped. You are made ready. But what good is it to be hiding and not being used? I I was digging a a fence post uh, yesterday to fix it in my yard. And I didn't go to the, the, the shovel and say, start digging. That would be silly. Now, if we were like the shovel, the instrument, the tools, God is wanting to pick us up and use us, but we got to show up. We got to be willing to be used. And the Holy Spirit's power is going to help us do amazing things. We have to want to be used by God. And I know that sounds like a whole sermon itself. What do you mean? We have to be want to be used by God. There are some of us, or maybe more than, than, than we would like to admit, that have lacked a desire to even let God use us. Well, let him know. Be honest with him. And then ask him to give you that desire. He's not looking for your abilities. He's, you've heard this from so many pastors. I'm, I'm not even going to lie. I'm, not ta- I'm just taking it. It's true. He's not looking for, for ability. He's looking for availability. He's just looking for availability. And the more and more you're with God in your quiet time and you're alone, and the more you start obeying him and following him and stepping out in faith, you're going to be more aware. And you're going to realize, oh, I'm available today, Lord. Use me. Secondly, last thing, we must step out in faith. This is going to be so simple. You're going to be mad at me. You're like, really, Ryan? We have to step out in faith and obey God's command to love people. Why do I say that? The reason why Peter looked at that man's eyes is because of the love of God. Peter loved that man because Jesus wanted him to love him. We're supposed to love God and love others. That's the greatest commandments. Peter loved that man enough to stop before he went into prayer meeting and pray for a healing, expecting it to be done. It's love that drove Jesus to go to the cross. It's God's love that he would send us the Holy Spirit. It's God's love that we would go and pray and encourage and speak the name of Jesus. It's motivated by love. I bet you can do that. I know you can. I know you can love people. So let's let's pray for a moment. Real quick, just speak to God before I say this, this scripture again. Where are you in your heart? Do you need to trust him? Do you need to step out and trust him? Because following the spirit is is stepping out of your comfort zone, walking by faith and letting the Holy Spirit use you. Is that you? Well, ask him to help you. If you've believed that God can't use you, ask him to correct that thinking real quick right now. If you just lacked a desire to be used by God, Ask him to change that, to fix that, fix your heart and your faith in him using you. If you've been distracted with the things of this world and has kept you busy with the wrong things, be honest with God and tell him. And ask him to use you from this point forward to be preoccupied with the work of God. God, we thank you that you're changing our hearts today as we confess these things, as we turn away from them and repent. God, we see that you want to use us, that you came to fill us and to lead us to carry out your mission. I thank you, God, for this church. Being here for 66 years in this community, and you're not done with us. I thank you for all the churches around here preaching the name of Jesus. 
God, bless them. Fill our churches, Lord, because we go out and live for you, led by the Holy Spirit and filled with him. Lord, fill our churches so that we can praise and worship with those who once were lost, but now they're found. And would you just agree with me as I say these words? You can just say amen out loud. You can just, whatever you want to say, say yes, Lord. Just agree with me. Ready? And now, O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. God, use me. Use us in the power of the Holy Spirit. Your power, not our power. Stretch out your hand from this place, Lord. Let us be your hands and feet in Jesus' name. Lord, use us in a powerful way, God. And may we not just get distracted with the holidays and Christmas season. This is the greatest time to share the gift of Jesus Christ. God, use our production, use our Christmas Eve services, use the presence, but use our people too every day. God, may we proclaim the name of Jesus. Lord, may we show Jesus. And God, may we go with miraculous signs and wonders being done through your name, your holy servant, Jesus Christ. Thank you, God. God, we see the world and what it's going through. We hear the threats against Christianity, but mainly against your name. We hear the mocking and the insults, but Lord, many of them do it in ignorance. And for those who don't, deal with them, God. But Lord, we're out to see those who be willing to believe. We're out there to even reach those who are angry and and against us, God. And we pray that through our lives, you would change their hearts and they would believe in Jesus Christ. God, we pray for the salvation of Dover, Delaware and beyond and our world, Lord. And God, I pray that for all of us who have been just burdened by this world, that we can turn around and be a light in the dark. Holy Spirit, fill us. Use us, and God, forgive us for not depending on your spirit, for not looking at the mission fields. God, we're sorry. And Lord, we want to be used by you. I know that's our true heart. We want to be used by you. God, I pray that we as a church could just be in so much unity that we won't fight or bicker over the wrong things. We'll put our eyes on you and just get out there and reach the lost. Lord, use us in ways we never expected, but we need to begin to expect it. We need to expect your spirit to work through us because you've sent him to do that. So Lord, change our mindset, our heart, our expectations. May we pray prayers like that, dangerous, audacious spirit-filled, powerful prayers to use us today, God. Thank you for this church. If there's anyone in this place who doesn't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to stop running after everything else and run to Jesus. In fact, he's already run to you. He's already come to you today. He's been speaking to you online. He's been speaking to you in this room. There is no other name, no other thing, no other There's nothing in this world that's going to save you from the coming wrath and destruction and nothing else can offer eternal life. Trust in Jesus. Believe in your heart that Jesus died for your sins and rose again to give you eternal life and you will be saved. Confess that with your mouth. Confess that in your heart. Believe it in your heart and confess it with your mouth that I am saved in Jesus Christ. If you need prayer today, we're going to be at the front here. And and if you need need prayer to give your life to Christ, we're here. If you're online, let them know. If you need prayer for anything, we're here. We're really looking forward to our prayer meeting next door in the kids' room tonight. Um, That's going to be interesting if a lot of you come out because it's it's a smaller room. So, but we're looking forward to that. So if you need prayer with anything, let us know today immediately after the service. God, we thank you. 
Bless this church as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Love you, church. God bless you.